Good afternoon, dear students, and a warm welcome to today's webinar on Fundamentals of Cybersecurity by Mr. Rajesh Kanapati. It's an honor and privilege to say a few words about Mr. Rajesh. He has 12 years of experience in network security, cloud computing, information security, and sales engineering. Currently, Director for Pre-Sales Engineering for Asia Pacific Japan and Middle East at Securinix Singapore, manager for sales engineering for Southeast Asia, Korea, and India at Imperva Singapore, senior pre sales consultant at MTech Singapore, senior network and information security consultant at NCS Group Singapore. Without wasting much of time, I welcome Mr. Rajesh Ganapati and request him to take over. Thank you, Anil. So Thank good afternoon, everybody. It's a privilege, it's absolute privilege to be on the call today. And thanks everyone for being in the call today, taking some time off on your weekend to attend this webinar. So I'm gonna keep this webinar very high level and I want to talk to you guys about some fundamentals of cybersecurity and also to give you a little bit of um, what to expect in a real world cybersecurity scenario and what to expect when a cyber attack actually happens in real world and some hints around how to protect yourself from cybersecurity attacks and what you can do to protect your loved ones from different types of attacks as well. So during the course of our conversation, if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to type it on the chat. I should be able to take those questions either during the entire session or at the end of the session. So without further ado, uh, let's just jump on into the presentation. So firstly, if you have guys, if you guys have noticed, cyber attacks are on the rise compared to five years ago or 10 years ago. You would see a lot more cyber attacks on the news now compared to what you have seen earlier a few years ago. The reason is simple. It's, it's just becoming a more and more of a norm of cyber attacks because a lot of organizations now are moving into digital transformation as organizations move into digital transformation, what's gonna happen is the sensitive information they have, um, any kind of personal identifiable information of their employees or their customers are all gonna be digitalized. It's gonna be stored in a digital medium. So when information that are very critical for an organization goes into a digital medium, that's when the cyber attack happens. And especially in this particular year of 2020, we are seeing a lot more attacks compared to the previous year and this, happens to be because of a couple of reasons, which are predominantly because of the COVID-19 pandemic that we are going through. What the COVID-19 pandemic has done is that it has made a lot of organizations to shift their workforce, their employees to remotely work from their home. As people go into working from home, most organizations were not prepared for such strategy of allowing their employees to go and work from home. So they have made very hasty decisions in order to open up their company's infrastructure, their sensitive information to be accessible from a remote place rather than how traditionally they were accessing from the, within their offices. So all these hasty changes have kept organizations in a place where they are a lot more prone to cyber attacks now because a lot of uh, access requests to company's sensitive information goes through a remote network now. And second thing is as ransomware are becoming more and more predominant now um, a lot of dark web and deep web services are now available, which allows anybody with a little bit of Bitcoins or some money in the credit card to access ransomware as a service where you can target any organization and you can give, the, you can send them a ransomware attack or a ransomware package, which thereby um, gets them to pay a ransom to you in Bitcoins to make this, the attack very successful as well. So these are two predominant things that we are seeing in the current threat landscape. And most of these, uh, threats that we see or the breach that we see um, are driven 70, more than 70% of the time it's driven financially. Attackers do what they do for a reason. And most of the time it's financially motivated, driven by the need for taking money from um, victims by ransoming them into paying them through Bitcoins because basically what the attackers are doing are trying to make their systems unusable, thereby bringing down their core business. And other 25% that we see are espionage. When we talk about espionage here, we are talking about uh, state-sponsored cyber attacks where a country sponsoring cyber attacks on a, on a 
a country of um, other origin or a opposing country to steal state secrets or critical infrastructure secrets, so on and so forth. And there are other 4% uh, which are typically miscellaneous, like a disgruntled employee trying to steal things from company before leaving an organization or insider threat kind of scenario. So even though there are different types of motivation, the end goal is that, or the end result here is that the attacks are just going up and up and it's not gonna go away anytime soon. Now, when we talk about the cyber attack life cycle, a lot of people have a misconception, especially watching a lot of movies, um, Hollywood movies or even Indian movies these days, have a lot of um, movie scenes where attacker just clicks a few buttons and then like, boom, I'm in and compromise the firewall, compromise the uh, intrusion prevention system, compromised any security solution that an organization has put in place. But in reality, that's not the case. In reality, it takes a lot of effort a lot of time and resource for an attacker to get into a victim's organization or a victim, victim's network. In reality, it's, it's a game of patience. A lot of attackers spend months and months of research before they were able to successfully enter or penetrate into a victim's network. When I talk about victim here, I'm talking about larger organizations, corporations, talking about government networks where people have sensitive information or information that is worth something. So typically there's lots of attacks that are going on across the globe statistics say about every 39 seconds there is an attack an average of more than 2000 attacks are performed on a daily basis now a typical a breach after it has happened the time it takes for an organization to detect that there has been a breach in their environment is about 206 days that's a lot longer more than seven months before an, a victim knows that they have been breached and once they know there was a breach, the time to containment, it's about almost a year, more than 300 days before a organization can identify that they have been breached and put in control measures and contain the damage that has happened. Now, looking at all these timelines of cyber attack lifecycle, it's a long game. It's not something that we can just do within a matter of minutes or a matter of days. It's a long game of patience and long game of resilience from both the attacker and the defender. And an average cost of a typical data breach is somewhere around 3.9 million to $4 million. And this is just the average cost. There are organizations who have suffered data breach that has costed them billions of dollars or even millions of dollars, multi-million dollars in terms of fines, in terms of business loss. So cyber attack is really a serious business. It can lead to organizations going bankrupt, losing reputation, losing businesses. And some of the notable cyber attacks that we can talk about in this year or in the last couple of years, first one um, I want to bring up here is the Experian breach. Experian is an organization uh, which involves in consumer credit report. So they have information about uh, consumers who use credit cards, what's the credit report and their personal identifiable information. So the Experian breach actually exposed about 24 million consumer information into the wild. Um, and this happened just using a simple fraud technique that was applied by the attacker, um, making himself look like somebody who is a legitimate business partner to Experian. And Cognizant earlier this year had a maze ransomware attack where the multiple systems were compromised by the maze ransomware, which ended up having most critical systems from CTS to go um, unoperational. And allegedly CTS paid about $70 million in ransom to restore the services. And Zoom app, the, the app that we are currently using for this webinar, even they had their own set of issues earlier this year. So as more and more people started using Zoom this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Zoom has become one of the go-to tool for a lot of organizations. When more organizations and more employees start using a service or a specific application, that's the gold mine for an attacker. So typically the attackers would want to try and do funny things on an application that is more commonly used. In this case, zoom bombing was a technique that was used by attackers. So what they did is that they found uh, zoom rooms that are not protected enough and try to listen in or eavesdrop into conversations of organizations having sensitive meetings or people who are talking about sensitive uh, discussions about their organization's financial structures, organization's uh, strategy, and they were able to exfiltrate information or at least sabotage some of the information using zoom bombing. And Zoom after that had put in some very strict measures around putting a password for most of the meeting rooms, having a stronger encryption mechanism for 
uh, disabling the attackers from actually eavesdropping as well. And the last one I want to talk about is Garmin. So people who are not familiar with Garmin, Garmin is a GPS based services provider. So you have Garmin GPS for your cars, you have um, Garmin watches and Fitbit trackers, which kind of looks at your um, fitness data based on how much you walk, so on and so forth. I am a personally, I'm a user of Garmin and Garmin uh, ransomware attack, which happened earlier this year, rendered some of their critical services unusable and Garmin had to pay multi-million dollar ransom to get the attackers to release the decryption key so that they can start going back into the business. So these are some of the cyber attacks. And if, I, if you look at um, the link that I've provided at the bottom, cybers, breaches, and incident news, you can go there and see almost every day there is a bunch of attacks that are always reported. So cyber attack is not something that, that you just see on the television once in a few weeks or once in a few months. It happens almost every day. Just the criticality and the severity of the cyber attack differs based on how much damage it causes. Now, some of the insights that I have for 2020, um, firstly, the bad guys are a lot more active than ever. We can, see that, we can see that most organizations suffered a cyber attack compared to the previous years. There is a jump of about 2% compared to the last year. We have about 80.7% of organizations suffering some sort of cyber attack, either from an external party or from an internet threat scenario. And they have had some incidents that has been flagged as a true positive. And ransomware payments continue to rise. A lot of organizations now are going into the thought process of it's only a matter of time before they can get into a ransomware based attack or as a, become a victim of ransomware. And we start to see a lot more um, organizations that get into being a victim of ransomware and about 58% of all these organizations actually paid the ransom to get the decryption keys. And most importantly, this is common across any cybersecurity professional. If you ask them, they would say, no matter how much technology you put in place, no matter how much process you put in place, the weakest link within an organization or when it comes to deploying and implementing a cybersecurity framework, the weakest link is always the people. The people have to be in a place where they are very well trained about the process. They do their due diligence to make everybody's work environment uh, safe, make themselves safe from cyber attacks and don't do any shortcuts and always be cyber savvy. And most organizations always talk about their actual employees who are obviously not the people um, from the cybersecurity department, but mostly let's say like HR department or people who are not from a technical background, they are the most targeted because the attackers would send uh, phishing emails or drive by download links to those people who are not technically savvy and they tend to click on uh, some of the malicious links and get themselves compromised and giving them um, a door op or opening a door for the attackers to get into the organization. But that's not all the bad news. We also, we also have some good news here. IT security is now becoming a lot more dominant as a business requirement. Um, IT security has always been an afterthought for most organization, maybe five years, 10 years ago. But now the CEOs, the CFOs, people who really hold the money or the budget, they all have started to realize that cybersecurity is one of the most important factor or one of the most important thing that they have to take care of in an organization to make sure the business is sustainable and successful. And now this kind of thought process change has enabled a lot more organizations to put in advanced measures, put in the right process in place to make sure IT security is something that has been taken care of. And more and more organizations are now adopting advanced analytics. Uh, what has been primarily um, a manual job in terms of investigation or in terms of uh, security monitoring is now being automated using machine, using machine learning and using big data based analytics. Now that is a really good news because what has been too complex to monitor in the last few years are now becoming a lot more easier to monitor for most organizations. Now, when we talk about cybersecurity, Cybersecurity is really a very broad topic. It's broad, it's deep, and there's, we're probably gonna have to learn cybersecurity through reading multiple books, which are usually like 800, 900 pages. But when it comes to a framework or a very high level framework of what cybersecurity actually means to most cybersecurity professionals and to most organizations is that it can be kind of uh, briefed with five different stages. First, identify 
what are your assets and what are the threats that are targeted at those assets. Protect the information that is actually stored in those assets and make sure that only people who are allowed to have access are given the right amount of access to those information. In case of an attack, make sure you have the composition controls, you have the right tools, the right visibility to detect the attacks and any intrusions or possible intrusions which could compromise the asset that stores your information which is critical for your organization. And in case there is an attack, always have a plan on how to respond to attacks. It could be as simple as blocking an IP address. It could be as simple as turning off a machine before the ransomware fully encrypts the software within the machine or the data within the machine. And once all of this happens, what's your backup strategy? How do you recover from the damage caused by the cyber attack? By putting these five pillars into consideration, a cybersecurity framework can be implemented by most organizations. And the efficacy of this particular framework really depends on the process and how much due diligence that most organizations take over from this cybersecurity framework. Now, this is something again, um, resounding or something that I'm talking about based on a few slides uh, earlier I spoke about. There is no such thing as click few buttons and you can probably get into a victim's endpoint or a laptop and compromise an entire network or bringing down a complete power grid. It never happens like that. Typically it's a process and it's a very well detailed process. So this is what we call as the cyber kill chain or the cyber attack kill chain. In a cyber kill chain, typically there is a reconnaissance phase all the way to an exfiltration or sabotage phase. So there are well-defined steps an attacker usually carries out to make sure that he gets to the point of where he wants. It can be as simple as uh, exfiltration of sensitive data from an organization for the sake of financial motivation, or it could be a sabotage whereby disabling systems or wiping out data to cause reputation loss for an organization. But to reach that point, it's not simple. There has to be predefined mechanisms, predefined tools and techniques that attacker typically uses in a very systematic way to reach to that level. And typically it takes months, sometimes even years to reach the point in most cases. I will talk about each of these stages one by one and explain uh, a few key concepts around how attacker actually performs this cyber skill chain. But the good news is for an attacker to be successful, he has to complete the entire kill chain. But for a defender or a blue team or a organization security personnel, all they have to do is break this chain before it reaches the final stage. So we are at an advantage, but it is a game of time. It is a game of patience. It's a game of skill set, uh, And it's pretty interesting from both the attacker's perspective and the defender's perspective, because this is just like playing a police and a thief kind of uh, scenario, but in a cyber world. Now, when we talk about reconnaissance, which is the first stage of a kill chain, uh, for people who are familiar with uh, first person shooting games or uh, games that are very, uh, very in line with military activities, you guys would have heard the uh, term recon missions or reconnaissance. So what typically reconnaissance is that you don't really do any damage, you don't really do any attack, but you simply observe. As an attacker, what the attacker does is that simply observes the victim that he has in mind. It could be an organization, it could be a person, it could be a government entity, it could be a service provider, it could be anybody. Whoever the attacker wants to um, make them as a victim or steal data or sabotage. So when during the reconnaissance stage, what the attacker usually does is knowledge gathering. In knowledge gathering, there's a couple of ways to do knowledge gathering. There is active knowledge gathering, uh, what we call as active uh, reconnaissance and passive reconnaissance. In active reconnaissance, the attacker simply probes for information from the public websites, looking at running a scan and understanding what kind of services um, the corporation uses and what are the weak points within those services. Passive basically means that instead of probing anything, he looks at publicly available information. Like, um, does this particular company has a website? If it has a website, where is it hosted? Any information that is available and gathers as much knowledge as possible. Typically in a reconnaissance phase, the attacker tries to get a knowledge of the weakest link within the organization or the weakest person within the organization who is the prime target for him to open the door into the organization. And reconnaissance takes the most time because the reconnaissance is the key to success for an attacker. The more information he has before he actually performs an attack, he can put together a very systematic plan of his attack 
and how he's going to execute this attack. So reconnaissance takes quite some time. And once the reconnaissance is successful, this is where the attacker moves into the next stage. With the information that he has from the reconnaissance stage, he performs weaponization, second stage of the kill chain. In a weaponization, the knowledge that is gathered from reconnaissance comes in very handy. For example, let's say a specific company who he wants to attack has a public facing website. He can understand from reconnaissance what kind of application was used to develop the particular website, what version of web server it is running. By having all this information, he can go into exploit DB or any other commonly available um, database to understand what specific version has what kind of bugs or vulnerabilities associated. If a specific version of a web server or application has a vulnerability, he can easily get an exploit that is available uh, and he, or he can even develop his own exploit depending on the complexity and sophistication of the attacker. And once he develops a malware, which he's gonna use for the attack, now he's gonna make it a deliverable payload because not every malware that is available in the market or being developed can be delivered to the attacker, sorry, to the victim or to a person inside the victim organization directly. So they will make it as a deliverable package, which then can be sent to the victim. So the third is delivery. How is he going to send his malware or his spyware into a victim's network or an organization? Typically, there are multiple ways to do it, but most commonly um, used ways are by drive-by downloads or spear phishing emails or attachments. So what this actually means is that the attacker takes his malware, embeds his malware uh, into a website, which is actually weak, but he has already gathered information that this company employees actually use those websites to access some stuff. If the website itself is weakly coded, he can ingest his malware into the particular website and thereby forcing the employees to download certain malware package from the website that they commonly use. That's one method of doing it, but it's quite complex because you have to find what websites typically the employees use and make sure that you can compromise that particular website that is more complex, but the most easy way or the most common way is by emails. And it's so easy to actually send a phishing email to most organization and make people click on those emails. And in emails, it can be an attachment, it can be a link um, that can be sent. And all a attacker has to do is to either do a social engineering attack, or he has to do a little bit of research around one employee name, go to LinkedIn, find the employees, coworkers from LinkedIn and spoof an email as if the employee's coworker is sending him an email. So by doing that, he can put a simple attachment. It could be a word file. It could be a PDF file. It could be an Excel file with macros and embed his malware code into that particular attachment and send across to the victim. Now, once the victim receives the delivery, the delivery stage is complete. Now, after the delivery stage comes the exploitation stage. The moment the victim opens the file, the malware executes. Now, the malware might not be a full stage malware or a complete malware. It could be the first stage of the malware payload. But what this malware actually does, or this particular code does, is that it exploits the vulnerability which the attacker has already identified um, using the reconnaissance and makes itself sufficiently placed with the right access rights into the victim's machine or into the web server. Now, once the exploitation is complete, there is a running code of malware on the victim's endpoint or server, then comes the next stage, installation. Now in the installation stage, the malware installs itself with, with sufficient privileges and then performs its own checks in terms of other information which the attacker could not have, could not have gathered during the reconnaissance because he was doing the reconnaissance from outside the network. The moment he comes into the network using this automated script, now he can run a scan on the victim's endpoint. He can run a scan on the victim's server and he can understand a lot more information about the victim's asset than what he had before. And he can automate the script for this particular malware to go to the internet and download a lot more tools. That's gonna give him a lot more um, added advantage and give him more sufficient rights to totally take control of the particular victim's endpoint. Now, once installation is done, this is where the command and control comes in. In a command and control scenario, the victim now has complete control of the machine because what the command and control or most commonly called as C2 communication is that the malware now beacons out to the victim's control station or his laptop. So even if the endpoint or the server is switched off at the end of the day, the next day, the person opens his endpoint again, the malware is gonna start its process as a startup script and it's gonna connect back to the attacker, giving him full access to remotely control 
the victim's machine. So this is how the attacker kind of moves all the way from reconnaissance to the point of command and control. But once he gets into the command and control state, this is where he has persistent connections to one of the servers or the endpoint within a victim's network. Now with this persistence, he can start moving laterally to other systems within the organization. So typically most customers don't store sensitive data on their endpoints uh, because endpoints is just a means for them to access sensitive information, which are usually stored in databases or servers in the backend. So what the attacker typically does, uses this as a proxy or uses this as a jump server, the endpoint as a jump server, and then from here moves to the crown jewel of an organization, which is typically a database server where most sensitive information of the organizations are actually stored. Now, the last stage of the cyber kill chain is the exfiltration stage. And this is where the attacker performs the action that he intends to do. He can either steal the data, which could be an intellectual property, which could be company secrets from the backend database, or he could do some sort of sabotage where he can wipe away the entire database. If there is no backups that are taken by the company's administrator, it kind of build, brings the entire company's services down as well. Or the last way, or there are multiple ways, but one more way is to uh, kind of de encrypt all the data that is stored in those databases, thereby ransoming the organization to pay them some sort of dollars or bitcoins to provide the decryption key. So these are uh, different ways uh, attacker actually moves into the system and performs what he wants within an organization. Now, I wanted to talk about a little bit of case study on how the attack actually happens using a real world scenario. So this is, um, a data breach that happened in Singapore, IHIS, uh, which is the IT arm of Singapore's healthcare, um, Sing Health. And uh, there was about 1.5 million records of Singapore residents, including VIPs of Singapore that was breached a couple of years ago. And one good thing about Singapore is that in, in case of a cyber attack, in case of a breach, they have to do a full audit in terms of how the breach actually happened and what are the um, compensation controls that they have to put in place to make sure it does not happen again. So the full report kind of revealed to the world how the attacker actually performed his um, overall data breach action, what are the steps he has taken and how he infiltrate, infiltrated the his um, environment to exfiltrate sensitive information. Now, PDPC fined IHIS about a million dollar for the data breach uh, following the cyber attack. And in Singapore, it's pretty common for organizations to get fined uh, in case of a cyber attack, which is resulted because of the organization not doing their due diligence. And it's becoming more and more common now with a lot of regulatory compliances that are put in place globally. Like for example, GDPR in the Europe, um, which kind of um, plays a massive role in making sure organizations make sure they keep the customer's private information or uh, personal identifiable information in a secure manner. In case of a data breach, GDPR mandates organizations to pay hefty fines to make sure it does not happen again. So data security is now becoming part and parcel of the complaints and people are, th those complaints were used to be something that are good to have in the few years ago, but now it is becoming a part of the regulatory audit and it carries a hefty fine for most organization, which is making a lot more organizations um, afraid of not complying to stricter security controls. Now, the key events of the cyber attack um, that happened in IHIS is kind of visualized here. Uh, if you look at this particular kill chain mechanism, um, I, I went through the overall stage of cyber, cyber, cyber security kill chain or cyber attack kill chain. You will notice a very good similarity between what the framework says and how the actual attack here took place. As you can see here, the initial entry point for the attacker into ICE environment was a workstation, an endpoint workstation used by one of the employees in healthcare institution A. And that happened on 23rd of August, 2017. But the after the particular initial reconnaissance finished and the first delivery done and the initial entry happened, the attacker didn't really get into stealing data right away. He had to do a lot of homework to make sure he is not identified he doesn't cause suspicions. He doesn't throw a lot of red alerts. Instead, the attacker took his steps very carefully, very calculated, 
making sure that he's not detected, that he's inside the organization. It took him about, as you can see here, took him quite a few months before he was able to laterally move and escalate his privileges into another workstation within a different institution that shares the same network. So once he was there, it took him again about six months before he can compromise one of the jump hosts that has access to the actual database server that holds sensitive medical records. Now, as you can see here from 26 June, when he accessed here, from there on, he accessed to the database and performed query and transferred sensitive information from this DB servers back into here, then exfiltrated them back again into the initial workstation and exfiltrated it out of the organization via internet. Now, the whole workflow took a lot of time, a lot of patience from the attacker, and he had to make sure that along his line, right from the entry point, all the way to the red exfiltration, he has to go unnoticed. So he can't do things that uh, make a lot of noise. He has to make his actions very slowly. Like for example, if he's trying to do a password attack, uh, brute force attack, he can't do password brute force on a daily basis. If he does that, it's gonna create a lot of noise. And somebody who is monitoring the logs, security logs are gonna bring it up, say, hey, I'm seeing a lot of uh, password failures on this particular machine which could cause a serious red flag and people would have noticed it. But instead, he calculated his steps very carefully. He made sure whatever attack he's performing, it was slow and low under the radar. And that is where the patience pays off for the attacker. So this is how a real world scenario actually happens. It's never a few buttons or it's never a, an attack that happened in just a day or so. And in this particular attack, like I said before, 1.5 million patient rec records were exfiltrated. It contained a lot of information about uh, personal information about people's address, their mobile numbers, their email addresses, uh, and also some of the patient's um, healthcare reports about what illness, what medication they had. And an interesting, um, interesting finding here or observation here is that the attackers were very interested in getting information about the Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Lee Sin Lung, his medical record. And why, why would they be interested is that See, um, healthcare reports or healthcare records are very sensitive. Uh, when people have some sort of, uh, when people have some sort of diagnosis and going into certain medication, it can be used as a sort of blackmail to extract money from them. So, for people who are familiar with um, deep web and dark web, when a banking sector gets compromised and the credit card information are being is being um, exfiltrated out of the banking sector or from any other system credit cards are sold in black market. And for example, if credit card is sold for $1 for a credit card information, health records are sold at a staggering $150. Healthcare information is sold at much, much higher rate compared to a stolen credit card. That's the value of a healthcare record. So it's not as simple as just a, what if, what if somebody knows I'm taking Panadol? What if somebody knows that I'm taking paracetamol? That's not the whole point. The point is that when you have a serious illness, when you have something that you don't want to um, tell the public, it can be used as a blackmailing technique for the attacker to actually ex um, ransom you into paying a lot of money to keep it secret. And that's why healthcare records are very sensitive in nature. Now, how is the industry moving or transforming um, based on all these changes? Now, first, we have seen, I've been in the industry almost a decade now, and what we have seen now is that more and more security vendors are getting together and started sharing information. Um, what has been a solo game before, where people have their own threat intelligence, people run their own research and bring in their own products and security tools to detect and stop threats, long gone, those days are long gone. Now, a lot of technology alliance are starting to take place. People share a lot of information. If I see an attack in the US this morning, somebody who is running a security tool or security operations in Singapore knows how the attack happened. What was the IP address that performed the attack? What was the technique that was used in the attack? This kind of community sharing is now happening. And it's not just the security vendors, even customers have started sharing information recently. When a customer sees an abnormal behavior or abnormal traffic coming from Russia or from China, they start sharing information about the kind of attacks that they are facing to other customers globally. And it's not just security vendor sharing, it's also vertical sharing. Banking customers shares information with other banking customers. 
uh, industrial customers share with other industrial customers, governments share information across to multiple ministries. So this community sharing is now giving us a lot more threat intelligence feed and the threat intelligence data points that helps us to curb a lot of attacks a lot more efficiently than how we had done many years ago. And now the second thing I want to talk about is people are now uh, making sure machine learning is something that they deploy into the security operations because as cyber attacks become more and more complex, more and more security tools are deployed in organizations. The more security tools that you deploy, the more security logs you have to monitor. The more security logs you have, the cumbersome it becomes because no human will be able to investigate a million logs within a day or investigate hundred different violations or incidents within a day. It's, it's, it's becoming more and more impossible. And it's becoming a point of finding a needle in a haystack. So what the industry is now moving into is instead of using a human to perform the manual interrogation or investigation or analysis, apply machine learning techniques, apply um, different algorithms that are um, useful for detecting abnormal behaviors and start flagging them as violations, thereby reducing the overall dependency on human and getting the machine to find the needle in the haystack. And a lot of security tools, um, even, even firewalls, uh, SIMs, um, user behavior analytics tools, all are incorporating machine learning as part of the code base now to make things a lot more automated. And the third thing that most customers are moving into and the security industry itself is moving into is to adopt the user behavior analytics. Because when you talk about cyber threat, cyber threat doesn't necessarily always come from an external attacker. A lot of cyber attacks also start from internal because an employee who is not happy with the company could be able to steal data from them before leaving the organization or could be able to delete away the data of an organization to make the organization go bankrupt or go out of business. So incident threat is real serious. And you guys know about Edward Snowden, I guess, which happened in earlier, earlier in the 2012, 2013 time scenario where he had access to everything um, most organizations would allow their employees to have access to, but nobody monitored the incident threat because traditionally security has always been about protecting the perimeter of an organization from external attacks. And they have never thought about people inside the organization are capable of stealing data or misusing the data. But Edward Snowden, that particular data breach or incident threat scenario brought a limelight on how important it is to start looking at your own employees on how they are accessing systems, are there any abnormal behaviors? So a lot of organizations now, especially security operations tools are now incorporating user behavior analytics using machine learning to create a baseline of how typically a user would um, work in an organization, what kind of files they typically access, what kind of servers they typically log in, what is their normal working hours and create a baseline or create a profile for them. And once a profile is built over a period of time, they start looking for anomalies. For, for example, a person who comes into office at nine o'clock and always leaves at six o'clock, suddenly comes into office at 12 a.m. in midnight. And he accesses a server which he has never accessed before and copied 10,000 files, which none of his teammates has copied before. So all this behavior anomaly, which was never seen before historically from his own behavior or from his teammates behavior can now be flagged as a violation. Now, this is going to be very helpful in detecting both incident threat and cyber threat alike. But the complexity of running machine learning, big data platform, sophisticated technology is that it requires a lot of um, resources. For example, people who are gamers here, if you, you can easily run a very simple game, uh, which I mean, when I was younger, we could run a game in what 128 GB RAM and probably a few cores in the laptop. But the current games that we have, you have to have a much higher specifications because the more complex and the more features that you have, the higher CPU and memory your machine is gonna require to run that particular process. And the same applies to cybersecurity as well. The more complex and sophisticated the solution that you are bringing into an organization, the higher the resources are going to be. And people typically cannot manage so many servers. How to have hundreds of two, hundreds, 200, even thousands of servers in a data center and how to manage them. It's gonna be very cumbersome and very tiring for most organization. And this is where organizations are now adopting to the cloud where they don't have to worry about the infrastructure and look at 
just the security operations and focus on cybersecurity and don't worry about infrastructure and let the cloud handle the infrastructure. So a lot of cloud adoption is happening. Cloud is becoming one of the key things in a lot of organization. And that's gonna always become one of the de facto way of adoption in the upcoming years as well. Now, when we talk about cyber attacks, who should be worried about cyber attacks? Is it, it's not just organizations, enterprises, governments that should be um, worried about cyber attack. Everyone should be worried about cyber attack because an attacker can target any of us. We can be a victim of cyber attack. We, we might not have sensitive information per se, but we still have information that we don't want to disclose. Our personal photographs, our personal messages to people, our bank account information on the phone, everybody can be a victim of cyber attack. And as more and more people go into a digital age where we have information that we used to have on a paper written somewhere, now it's on our phone. If a phone gets compromised, almost everybody's personal diary is compromised if a phone gets compromised, right? So it's becoming more and more important for people to understand that cybersecurity is a serious business and it's everyone's responsibility. It's not just your company, your college, or your government's responsibility. It's your own personal responsibility as well. And attackers, like I said, they target everybody. And the whole consensus, when you talk to any of the cybersecurity professional in the market who has been in the cybersecurity industry for the longest time, they will tell you cybersecurity is something about, or a cyber attack is it's a matter of when and not if. You will definitely be a part of or a victim of a cyber attack in your lifetime. So it's never like, will I be for, um, targeted? No, it's about when are you going to be targeted? So it's, it's something that, that's going to happen, but we can reduce our risk by making ourselves more um, knowledgeable about cyber risk, how attackers work, and what are the due diligence that we have to do to make sure that we are safe in the digital age. And just a few comments from my side um, on how to protect your own files and devices on your endpoints or your mobile phones. Always keep your software up to date. There is a re the reason why there are updates in your apps, there are updates on your Windows machine or Mac machine. Mm -hmm. There are bugs. Uh, application is just a software. Software is something that is written by a person by using a code. A person is um, capable of making mistakes, right? Everybody performs mistakes. When a code is not properly tested, when a code is incomplete, it can have bugs, bugs or vulnerabilities, which can be exploited by an attacker to take control of your machine and to steal data from you. So typically organizations or um, apps or any services, they provide updates to you. So always keep your applications, your laptops and servers, or whatever you're using, up to date to the latest version. Always secure your files. Make sure any sensitive information that you have is password protected. And if possible, encrypt your devices using a boot encryption on your laptop. If your phone allows you to encrypt your, your data, go ahead and encrypt it as well. Always use complex passwords. Don't use your birth date. Don't use your girlfriend, boyfriend name. It's so easy to guess. Don't try to put the name followed by a one or dollar sign. That's the first thing attacker always tries. As most Applications start asking you for complex passwords, like you have to be uppercase, lowercase, number, and uh, a and a symbol. I'm, I'm sure half of the group here would be guilty of the fact your username has a one and a dollar, or has a first word as uppercase and last word as uppercase. This is very common, right? And and attackers guess that too. So make sure you have a very complex thing, complex password, and always cycle your password more often than necessary, uh, at least once in a couple of months. Don't keep the same password and don't share the same password across your different accounts as well. And if the application that you're using, like social media website that you're using, allows for a multi-factor authentication with a one-time password to your mobile phone, please use that. Keep yourself safe from any attacks where your social media account could be compromised because you're using a simple password and no multi-factor authentication enabled. And when we talk about ransomware, if you are worried about being a victim of ransomware, just a few entry points that you need to be worried about or to be careful about. Take note of scam emails. If you are receiving scam emails, don't, don't uh, try and click on the links that you're seeing there. Try to ignore them, mark them as spam. If you know that a sender is somebody you don't know about or you don't know who they are, don't click on any of the links. Don't open any of the attachment uh, of things that you're not expecting. Don't go to websites that are not um, whitelisted. Don't try to um, go into shady websites that are sent by somebody in a link. Try not to go to infected websites. That's one of the biggest way how ransomware also comes into your endpoint. And don't click on online ads that you see from um, 
suspicious websites or any websites which are questionable. And make sure that you always monitor your vulnerabilities and update your software as well. And when it comes to spear phishing attachment, um, one of the most common ways of how people get compromised or the endpoints get compromised is from an email or a text message from somebody which looks very real because spoofing an email is so simple. Anybody can do a spoofing an email in just a couple of minutes. And it looks as if it's very urgent and you have to click on it quickly. It could be like as simple as your professor asking you to send, hey, can you submit this particular coursework through this link? It looks urgent. They will ask you like, you have to submit it within 6 p.m. today. Click on, click on this link to submit. It looks very legit because the attacker could have used your professor's name and kind of uh, typo squatted the domain to look very legit and make it look urgent for you to click on it and do something. And it usually makes you excited. Those kind of spear phishing emails always has some sort of exciting message in it that makes you want to click it. So always be careful about those kind of emails as well. And typically the attacks usually come from attachments um, from an email or delivered by an email. And there are incident threats as well. And spear phishing is one of the very most common, like I said. So always, always be careful about clicking on emails, or opening attachments from emails that you don't trust. And Nigerian print scam. For people who do not know about Nigerian print scam, this is like a kind of a internet lingo where you get emails saying that uh, so and so money is there in an account and I need your help uh, to take that money into your account and I will give you 10%, 20% if you can just uh, send it across the rest of the money to different accounts. This is a very classic scam email where they try to get you to reply and ask you for your bank details. And they'll say like, hey, can you send me like $50, $100 um, as a deposit uh, so that I can open an account from where I can send the money to you. So this scam still happens, unfortunately. Even um, you guys are young, bright minds. You wouldn't fall into this trap, I hope. But always make sure that you tell your loved ones, people who are at home, who are not technically savvy, not to click on emails where some sort of very exciting messages comes to them as a offer that cannot be resisted, right? And for people who are looking at cybersecurity as a career choice, some, some insights I wanna share. Um, in today's market, cybersecurity is at huge demand. If you are looking at cybersecurity as a career, I would definitely, definitely um, encourage you guys to link it, look, it, look at cybersecurity as a career, career path. It's very exciting. And cybersecurity unemployment rate is literally 0% because there's so much demand. If you are somebody who is into cybersecurity, there's so many job openings and we are trying to find people who are eligible um, to replace, I mean, or to fill up our positions. I personally have been recruiting people for many years and it has always been a challenge for me to find good, um, good personnel who are technically savvy, who are cyber aware, and who have a passion for cybersecurity. So it's a huge industry for you to look into for a career choice. And uh, by 2021, as you can see here, there's 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs globally. That's that's such a pro projection, right? And it's only gonna grow as more and more cyber attacks are gonna happen, more and more cyber security jobs are gonna come up as well. And it's not just a single career path. When people talk about cybersecurity, it's not just one job. There's dozens and dozens of different jobs that are towards a cybersecurity uh, vertical. These are just some of the names here, but cybersecurity itself is a broad place. Uh, you can be a programmer and still work in cybersecurity, developing cybersecurity tools. So all I'm saying here is cybersecurity is a discipline where you will not be let down um, if you were considering it as a choice. And last slide from me is that I would say Pursuing a career in cybersecurity, it's very rewarding. It's hard work. It's definitely hard work, but it's very rewarding, both financially and mentally. Uh, you always wake up in the morning, uh, making sure or make, uh, making you think that you have made the world a better place by stopping um, cyber attacks or um, stopping people from doing or victimizing somebody who is innocent. So there is a great mental peace working in cybersecurity as a career. And you have to be very passionate because it's really hard work, but it's very rewarding. And there is a huge potential to grow. So that's that's all from me. Um, I'm more than happy to take questions. And I hope that I have given you guys some sort of uh, high level overview around cybersecurity and uh, probably or hopefully um, 
encourage some of you to consider cybersecurity as a serious career choice. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Rajesh, for this wonderful session. Definitely, this session was attention grabbing and and it was very simplified by using day-to-day -day examples and uh, for presenting the case study, which has definitely helped us to understand the subject well. So uh, all the participants would have definitely benefited from this session and to have a better understanding on this topic, I would throw open this floor for question and answers. So dear participants, re request you to type all your queries, uh, whatever doubts you have or whatever clarification you need uh, the, using the chat box and Mr. Rajesh would be glad to help you all. Thank you. Thanks, Anil. So that's a very interesting question. Um, are Google, Facebook, Twitter, and other social media are watching us? Uh, okay, so I wouldn't say they are watching us, but they are definitely monitoring us. So I'm not sure if you guys have noticed, I have noticed this many years ago, right? Um, when you do a simple Google search, right? Uh, let's say if you're interested in buying a car or buying a motorbike, or just you are interested in going for a holiday, for example, you do a Google search to find restaurants or hotels in the place where you want to go. You would notice when you open Facebook, you would see advertisement on Facebook about the place you just searched a few hours ago or a few days ago. How does it happen? Machine learning and analytics. They, they're not constantly monitoring when you logged in, what are you searching? They're not doing that. Nobody is monitoring you directly. But what they are doing is that your information is logged. Whatever search that you're doing in Google, it's logged. Whatever you are posting on Twitter is logged. And these logs are taken put into a machine learning algorithm and the algorithm churns business intelligence reports and tells Facebook or any other provider what you would be interested in. So this is more of a targeted marketing technique that uh, Facebook and Google uses. Um, so they're not really monitoring you personally, but they know everything about you more than you know. Um, for Food for Thought, I have watched this specific um, documentary in Netflix called The Social Dilemma. I would really recommend you guys to go watch the particular uh, documentary, The Social Dilemma. It talks about how big organizations like Google, YouTube, and Facebook, Twitter, they make sure that your atten attention is theirs. The notifications that you get every few, few minutes in your, um, in your mobile phone so that you constantly watch YouTube or Facebook. The more and more you watch, you are the product, right? So any, any solution that you're using, if you're not paying for it, then you are the product. And I 100% I believe in that. If it's a free service means, there's no, such, no, there's no free lunch in the world. You are the product. For Facebook, you are the product. For YouTube, you are the product because they stream revenue based on the amount of clicks that you do on the advertisements and the amount of data that you, points you give them so they can sell your information to third party. So I hope that answers your question. Another question I see here is that keep in mind for full stack in terms of security. What are things I should keep in mind as a full stack web developer in terms of security? So a developer um, primarily, right? Um, before six, seven years, a developer is a developer, a security person is a security person. But now things are different. You're a full stack developer, you are application developer or your application architect, it doesn't matter. Security by design, security by um, implementation, and security by principle is something that most organizations are looking for. Even as a developer, uh, no matter what programming language you use or what technology stack that you use as a developer, you still need to have the fundamental concepts of security. The CEA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. You have to write your code in a way that you are only giving access to people that are um, supposed to access the data, and you should have strong authentication mechanisms to make sure that application that you're developing is accessible after a powerful authentication process. The integrity of the data cannot be changed by an unauthorized person or even an authorized person. If somebody writes data, you have to make sure that integrity of the data is always there. And you have to make sure your solution or your application that you develop is always available against any attacks and make sure the resiliency is there as well. I hope that answers your question. 
is it possible to exploit a computer or institution without even sending an exploit script? Yes, it's absolutely possible. You don't really need an exploit script um, to exploit a computer. Um, so exploit scripts are something that works on top of a vulnerability, right? So if there's a vulnerability, you can run an exploit to take over the machine by basically leveraging on the particular vulnerability. But social engineering is one of the biggest ways to do without an exploit code. So if I know what your best friend's name or your favorite place, and I can do a social engineering attack on you, or I can just give you a call and ask you, hey, um, um, where are your plans? What, what, are, what are you like most about as a friend or impersonating as a friend from Facebook or LinkedIn? I can get some information out of you. I can build a profile around you and I can use your password by guessing your password or doing a password spray attack to legitimately access your machine and exploiting you using social engineering without actually sending an exploit. So that is also possible. How can an engineering student begin their journey in cybersecurity, what to study, how to begin and where? For, I started my journey as an engineering student, right? So, um, so when I was in my third year of my bachelor's degree, that's when I had a module called Network Security Module. And that kind of piqued my interest into the security domain. And I've been focused on security ever since. Uh, I, I did my master's entirely on computer security and resilience. And ever since then, uh, I did a lot of uh, certifications around cybersecurity vendors, compliances, and a lot of uh, certifications around process that are related to security. So for an engineering student, I would recommend um, not just going through your college textbooks, but internet is your friend. There is so many uh, tools that are available now in the market, which was not available 10 years ago. Um, there are tools, platform that gives you uh, free courses around cybersecurity to get you started. There are books available on Amazon, which are free to download for you to kickstart your cybersecurity uh, interest. But what I would say is that cybersecurity is a broad place. You cannot be the king of everything. So find your interest within cybersecurity, find what you really are passionate about. Are you looking into application security? Are you looking into data security, um, system security, network security? Identify what you are more passionate about, then focus your energy on that particular uh, vertical within cybersecurity. Very interesting question. What certifications you look for First, to recruit a person in cyber and security nowadays, which one is trending a long running certification? Is an industri industrial certification cyber and security more important or? So this is a very interesting question because I personally don't look at certifications when I hire people. I look at attitude. I look at um, how much they are passionate about in learning things and how much experience they carry and how much of a team player they are. Cyber certi certifications are good for you to kickstart your career, but more and more and more vendors are providing more and more certifications and certifications are becoming a lot more common for a lot of organization, um, a lot of people these days. And it doesn't really bring the true value of a person. Um, yes, I, I, I strongly urge you guys to study, learn things, certification. Yes, take it if you want to, but just because you hold a certification doesn't guarantee you a job. What really guarantees your job is how you impress the person about your market knowledge, your technology uh, knowledge, your passion about learning and what you want to do in the long run. That is what makes recruiters and interviewers want to give them a chance, not just because they have 10 to 12 certifications on the CV. I, I seldom look at certifications. I, I look at the experience that they carry and how much attitude they present during the interview. Does Garmin GPS have their own bug bounty program? I am not sure. A um, lot of organizations do have bug bounty, uh, bug bounty programs. Um, even governments now have bug bounty programs, but I'm not sure about Garmin GPS having a bug bounty program yet. Uh, you can try their website, but I, I, from an industry perspective, we see a lot of organizations now are open to the bug bounty program. Like Google has the bug bounty program. Facebook has bug bounty program. A lot of them are opening it up. And I hope uh, more more organizations will open up and uh, get more feedback from young minds, people who are not actual uh, em employees of organization as well. Is writing encryption algorithms a major role? 
I don't think people write encryption algorithms as a full-time job in many organizations. There, there are very big specialists who write encryption algorithms or develop encryption algorithms, right? It's more of a development of mathematical formula for encryption algorithms. We talk about DES, triple DES, AES, DHE, ECDHE. There are a lot of different algorithms. But end of the day, algorithms are mathematical functions on how an encryption happens, how a decryption happens, and how to make sure that this encryption and decryption is secure and how it cannot be broken or how much permutation combinations has to be considered before breaking it. But writing the algorithms using a specific code means that basically converting your mathematical formula into something that a computer or application understands. Now, most organizations do not have people to write encryption algorithms, but more on implementing the encryption algorithms or encryption strategy for, for the environment, for, for the um, environment within the organization. So writing encryption algorithm, interesting, as, as, as long as you want to work in a place where you want to convert mathematical functions into workable code. But the number of roles that you might find in the market would be very limited. What are the basic requirements that we must know in cybersecurity? What are the fundamentals in the field? The basic requirements um, when it comes to, for people who are starting first time into a cybersecurity career would be to have some sort of fundamentals around networks. Now cloud is very important. Understand how cloud computing works and how cloud computing is secured by the service provider and have a decent understanding of OS it can be Windows, it can be Linux, and I would strongly recommend to have more Linux than Windows because Windows typically endpoints are used using Windows, but most servers use Linux and server is where you have your critical data and, and services running. And Linux is very important to know. Um, understand how the OS actually works and uh, also understand a little bit around um, different techniques in terms of attackers, uh, tactics and techniques that they use to exploit a machine or um, get into an organization. Um, so OS, cloud computing, some sort of network security, I would recommend as some of the basic requirements before you jump into cybersecurity career. 5G network security, which will resolve, sorry, I'm not pretty sure about this question. 5G network is security aspect, which will resolve the security issue. 5G network, which will resolve the upcoming security. So 5G network security, so 5G, okay, first of all, before we talk about network security, right? You will need to understand the network first, how the network implementation works. We talk about application security after we understand the application. Now, 5G is an upcoming technology. 5G is something that is being slowly deployed across uh, different geographical locations. Now, 5G network security is not something that is very specific to 5G only, but th there are certain variations from 4G to 5G in terms of how the entire technology stack works. But network security is still fundamental network security. Um, so we have to wait for the adoption of 5G. We need to have a lot more people start using 5G. This network security principle comes in place as more and more people use the technology and more bugs are found and more uh, people find vulnerabilities um, by con constant usage. So we will not be able to tell much about 5G network security at this point in time because we need to have a lot more adoption in the market before we can talk about what kind of challenges 5G network is going to bring in and how we're going to resolve those challenges. Any book recommendations we can refer to? There's not one or two. There is just literally I can recommend hundreds of books. Um, but principles of cybersecurity is something that I would recommend. And uh, for people who want to kickstart something from the scratch, look into security plus certification books, not necessarily the certification, but look at the books that help you with uh, security certifications like um, Security Plus, that would be one of the recommendations that I would do. And I personally use um, apps like Udemy and Coursera to look for any new content. And I, and I, I don't really enjoy reading 1,000 pages of book. Typically, I find nuggets, uh, books that are like 100 pages to 120 pages over the weekend. I just learn those books. So that's my uh, recommendation. So yes. So Anil, um, any more questions? I think it's done, sir. Um, Mr. Rajesh, we'd like to thank you on behalf of ICERT for your valuable time and for your valuable inputs and definitely for this uh, 
advice that you are giving to our participants definitely it will help them to move ahead in a better way so once again thank you very much for your valuable time and lots of thank you the pleasure is all mine thanks everyone for taking your time this evening welcome sir bye bye